flow room. I want to welcome you and thank you for taking seats in there so that we can have more room in here to, uh, to fellowship. If you are new here, we want to welcome you to Countryside. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, as we begin, I want to read from Psalm chapter 68, verses 4 through 5. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. Let us stand and worship God this morning together. Who's never sung that song before? I'm curious. Has anybody never sung that? Okay, a couple of you have never celebrated Christmas. Um, <laughs> but there, it's, a, it's a great old song. Let's continue singing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let's continue singing uh, songs about the Lord's coming, and we're excited to celebrate uh, with Christmas worship to the Lord today. Let's sing Behold Him, our, our new song we introduced last week. across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of died with 
with sinners and saints. Heal the blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. Behold him. He who chose the criminal's end. Paid with blood to settle our death. Buried death as he rose to sustainer and savior father now open our eyes as we proclaim the gospel through communion to all that jesus is for us and we pray this in his name amen have a seat wow that's a powerful song to prepare us uh, for communion communion is a time during our weekly gathering where we Remember and celebrate what Jesus has done for us by dying on the cross. By taking just the bread and the juice together, we declare that we are in relationship with God and one another because of the death of Jesus Christ. Now, if you have not trusted in Jesus for your salvation, or if you are under church discipline here at Countryside or any other church, Uh, We ask that you refrain from participating this morning. This is the Lord's table. By participating, you're declaring your faith in Jesus, your commitment to follow him, and it doesn't make sense for you to do that unless you are operating, living out your faith. We ask you to simply observe our declaration of faith and consider the implications of Christ's death for your own sin. But if you're a believer, it doesn't matter whether you're a member of Countryside or not, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your personal Savior, then we invite you to join with us this morning. If you don't have one of the cups, uh, they are on the back table. Feel free to get up and uh, get one, please. 
Now, before we begin, as normal, we'd like to give you a few moments to reflect on your relationship with God. How is your heart this morning? Are you prepared to celebrate Jesus and all that He is for you through taking the Lord's table this morning? So reflect on your heart, confess any sin that you have been holding on to, and prepare yourself um, to take the Lord's table. So take a moment, ask God to search and reveal anything you need to deal with. As I said a moment ago, our participation in communion is a declaration of our relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And that relationship is only possible because in Christ, God has forgiven us. The sins that we have committed in the past are forgiven in Christ. The sins that we have committed this morning are forgiven in Christ. The sins that we will commit until the day we die are forgiven through the death of Christ for us. The Bible says that all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone in this room, every one of your pastors, every one of your deacons and small group leaders has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says... That before Jesus, we were by nature children of wrath. We refused to honor God as God or give thanks to Him. Before we came to Jesus, we made ourselves the enemies of God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's what everyone in this room has earned. Death. That's the penalty for sin. But the death of Jesus Christ has paid that penalty for us. And because of Christ, God has forgiven our sins. As Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Forgiveness, Paul says, is a gift. It came through the blood of Jesus and God extends it to you as an act of grace. It's a gift. We didn't earn it. We couldn't earn it. Taking communion doesn't earn you the gift of God. Attending church, giving money, being baptized, trying to be the best person that you can be cannot earn what God offers you as a gift. Nothing we could ever do would earn us the forgiveness of God. It's the death of Christ on the cross that makes that forgiveness possible. Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, and you who were dead in your trespasses... God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. God's forgiveness is not just a gift. It is an unbelievable Gift. It's the blessing of all blessings. It's the blessing we all need. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is, a man, is it the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. 
One of the great benefits of taking communion is being reminded of the death of Christ and how His death deals with our sin once and for all. The sins of our distant past, the sins of yesterday, and the sins of tomorrow's on into the future. When we arrive at the point where we realize that we are separated from God by our sin and trust that Jesus Christ died to reconcile us to God, we stand forgiven. And that's one of the reasons communion is a celebration because it's a declaration of that incredible and glorious truth. So as we eat and drink together, let's remember that because of the death of our Savior, we stand forgiven for all our sin. Please take the bread and the juice cup that you have and open. go ahead and open them up. Before we eat together, I'd like to ask one of our deacons, Ryan Vaughn, to pray for the bread. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time together as a church body to come before you and give you all the honor and the glory. We thank you so much for the debt that uh, you paid for your son dying on the cross. Um, we, we love you so much. I pray that our hearts would be softened towards you. We will be humble servants for you, Father. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together in remembrance of the forgiveness we share in Jesus. Before we drink, I'd like to ask another one of our deacons, Ryan Bucher, to pray for the juice. Let's pray. Lord, we take for granted the cost that paid for our sin. We numb ourselves to the idea of death. But God, the cost <coughs> is so great. God, we need to immerse our minds in your words so that we can know Christ know the cost that he paid. He paid for our eternal life, Lord. What a gift. We thank you for the blood that was poured out for us. Costs we could never pay. In your name, amen. Amen. Let's drink together in remembrance of the forgiveness we have in Jesus. All right, please stand as we continue in the worship of our Savior. Now we 
to sing uh, Silent Night before Pastor Brian comes to preach, and I uh, just want to warn you beforehand, we usually sing Silent Night really slow and really silent, so we're going to actually speed it up just a little bit, I just wanted to forewarn you. Um, so it, I, I think that in doing this, just to speak candidly, I think in doing this it actually helps us think about the, the joyful element of this song, rather than the silentness of the night, and I think this, this really adds to, um, as we sing it joyfully, it, it helps us focus on what's taking place. pray. Lord, thank you so much for the gift of your son, for the gift of forgiveness, for the gift of redemption, for the gift of grace. Lord, I thank you that uh, you, in your wisdom, chose to send your son to save us for, your, for yourself. Pray that as we go throughout this day, this week, this rest of this month, that we would anticipate not the, the things and the trappings of the season, but we would anticipate the Savior. Uh, I pray that you would help us to put our minds and our focus on him this morning. We ask this in your name. Amen. Right, thanks. You can, can be seated. Before we uh, get into the text this morning, uh, every time we sing Silent Night, I'm always reminded of one of my daughters who, who didn't, before she could really read and understood um, what everything was being said, round yawn. Well, it made sense to her to call her a round young virgin, so, <laughs> so, it's not, it's not Abigail that did that, so, it's not Amy either, so you can figure out who it was. <laughs> so, some of you got a shock, either last night or this morning when you opened up the sermon notes, and you saw Luke 1, 67 to 80, and then you saw Pastor Brian Neal, and you thought, oh no. <laughs> What are they thinking? 
<laughs> I did the same thing. I thought, oh no, what are they thinking? But uh, I'm excited to preach this text. I think it's a, a super important text, especially as we consider the time of year that we are. And because I believe it to be a super important text, I'd like for us to stand and, and follow along as I read it. So if you would please stand. It's a poem, so it's not really long. It says this, And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of, the holy, of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And then he goes on to finish the section with these words. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. He was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. That wasn't on the slide, that was mine. Go ahead and sit down. <clears throat> Anticipation is, uh, is a great thing, isn't it? When you anticipate, when you look forward to something, not dread. I'm not talking about the dread. I'm talking about anticipation. When you know something good is coming and you're just so eager to have the something good, you're so excited about what the good thing is, anticipation, it, it just, it makes the thing you're looking forward to seem bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. When I was a child, my mom and dad got my brother and I one year this great big gift. They wrapped it in the comics because it was too big to buy wrapping paper for. And they put it out under the tree and for, for, you know, for like three weeks, my brother and I were like, what is it? We're, we're all over what it is. What is it? Is it was it so, so great, this anticipation. And then Christmas morning came and we opened it. It was this little miniature pool table thing, which we thought, great, that's so exciting. We love that thing for about a day. <laughs> and then it got put away and we played it once in a while. But, you know, anticipation tends to make the thing uh, shine brighter than what it really is. Anticipation seems to make the thing um, more significant than what it might be, especially when we wait for a long period of time. Well, the Israelites, the children of Israel, the people in first century Israel had been waiting for something for a long time. They'd been waiting for something actually since Genesis chapter 3. I'm not going to go there, don't worry about it, but Genesis chapter 3, it actually started the whole process of this anticipation. And so time moved forward and they continued to anticipate this, this deliverer who would come to deliver them from their sins. And throughout the Old Testament, all this anticipation happens. We get narrowed down to, it's going to be a, 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 a descendant of Abraham. It's going to be a descendant of Jacob. It's going to be a descendant of David, or Judah, and then a descendant of David. We know all that, this special redeemer, this special deliverer is coming. And Daniel then, in Daniel chapter 9, I haven't got there yet, we're going to get there soon. In Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27, the times are laid out for this, this person to come, and actual dates kind of are given, the amount of years that have to pass. And so anticipation builds anticipation. And in fact, the Old Testament ends with anticipation. The Old Testament ends with this promise of the one who would come. And then God is silent for 400 years. And for 400 years, anticipation builds and grows and builds and grows. And because people can do math, they look backward and they do the time and they realize it's about time. Something is going to happen, and something's going to happen soon, and so they're anticipating this thing, they're anticipating this event, and it's a great big deal. And then Luke 1 happens, and God begins to provide the anticipated one. And what's great about the anticipated one is he does not fall short of the anticipation. In fact, he's more than they could ever have dreamed. He's bigger than he could ever have thought, and all these years of anticipation didn't even begin to set the stage.
for his entrance into on the scene. But before we get to his entrance, in, Mal in Malachi, at the end of the Old Testament, there's also a promise of one who would come before him. In Zechariah's day, Zechariah is doing what he's going to do, and the one who came before hasn't even been there yet. The one who would come, who would become the herald, who would be the proclaimer, to become the harbinger of the, 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 the one, hasn't even shown up on the scene yet. But they know he's got to come. They know he's got to be there. And then we come and we meet this little guy, this little priest called Zechariah. And that's where we'll start. Actually, the story starts. The story starts in Luke chapter 1, verse 8. Luke, yeah, Luke chapter 1, verse 8. In verses 8 through 11, here's where our story starts. It starts this way. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by law to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn the incense. And the whole multitude of the people were outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared before him an angel of the Lord standing on his right side at the altar of incense. Now, understanding this, there were a lot of priests in Zechariah's day. In fact, there were so many priests that not all of them were always in Jerusalem worshiping at the temple all the time. They, they, they kind of took turns. They were in courses. They came and served in courses. And as they came and served in courses, there were so many of them that they cast lots or they threw lots on the person who would be doing the individual jobs of the temple. Like someone would have to go in and light the, take care of the, the, the lamp stand, right? Someone would have to go in and do that. Someone would have to go in and change the showbread. That would have to be done. And someone would have to go in and light the altar of incense. Now, no one went behind, only the high priest on the Day of Atonement went behind the veil. But these were the things that happened outside the veil between the, in the holy place and not in the most holy place. So it just so happens that at this time, Zechariah is chosen by lot to go in and burn incense on the altar of incense. That's what he's supposed to do. And as he's there, as he's there, an amazing thing happens. An amazing thing happens. Zechariah is praying. Now, what he's praying, we don't know for sure, but we must have some idea. He's praying either for a gift of God as a son or he's praying for the Redeemer to come. The redemption that he's promised to happen, we know this because of the answer that is given. The answer that is given. But it's an it's amazing answer, but it also provides further complications for our story. Further complications are added to our story when we get to Luke chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. When we read this, Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and una unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which we fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. When he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When the time of his service was ended, he went to his home. See, so, so in the middle of 111 through 118, there's this promise given by God that Zechariah would have a son, and that this son would be the one to prepare the way for the one who would become the Messiah, the one who would be the Messiah. That's what's promised in the middle. And Zechariah catches on and hangs on to the fact that Zechariah was going to have a son with his wife Elizabeth because they're old folks. They're old people. And he's, he's like, I don't understand how it's going to happen. I, I, in, in some sense, there was unbelief. There was disbelief in Zechariah. I don't know his disbelief in the, in the promise of the Redeemer, but disbelief in the fact that he would have, he would have a son. And Gabriel says, Gabriel says, because you haven't believed, you're not going to be able to speak. You're not going to be able to speak. Well, typically, what would happen after the, the priest who was in the temple burning incense, he would do his incense, offer his prayer to God, and then come out and then bless the people. He would come out then and offer a benediction to the people. When Zechariah came out, rather than offer a benediction to the people, he was telling them he couldn't speak. He was telling them, I, I, I can't say anything. And maybe this is the first instance of like HSL, Hebrew Sign Language. They, he's making signs. Um, I don't know how it worked. Um, but he's trying to make signs to them. I don't think there was such a thing. So he's trying to explain to them. But they got through his signs. They got through the thing he was saying, that he had seen a vision in the temple. And while he couldn't describe what it was, he also couldn't give the benediction that he was supposed to give. 
until we get to Luke 1, 67. So you see, this is a benediction that was nine months and eight days in the making. This is a benediction that, that not only had, had, had Zechariah been anticipating the birth of the Savior, for nine months, nine months, Zechariah had been anticipating the birth of his son, and now for nine months and eight days, Zechariah has been anticipating the opportunity to say something. And so it makes it very significant, the things that he says. So understand, this is a blessing that had been anticipated for nine months and eight days. And Zechariah is going to bless the people. And I think in his blessing the people, there's a blessing for us. Before we get into the text, however, I think it's important because as we get to the application part or the implication part of this, we need to understand the, the structure of the poem. Phil talked last week about, about the structure of Hebrew pro poetry. It's not a rhyming and meter kind of poetry. You know, it's not like roses are bled, red, violets are blue, um, whatever. I don't know. I'm not going to make something up. I'm on too much pain medicine right now, so I better just stop. So, but the, the, the thoughts in Hebrew uh, per, um, poetry are parallel thoughts. Um, and this particular poem is a chiasm. It's a chiasm. And what a chiasm is, it's a, it's a series of thoughts that build down to a point and then back away from that point. And you know that because of the words that are used. I'll, I'll just walk you through it. In verse 67 and verse 78, you see the word visit or come, right? He will visit his people or he will come. So that you have that, 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 way, that, that um, similarity. In verse 68 and verse 77, working down and up, you see his people. And then in verse 69 and 77, you see the idea of salvation. Then in verse 70 and 76, you have the idea of prophets. In verse 71 and 74, you have the hand of our enemies. In verse 72 and 73, fathers, and then right next to each other, in verses at the end of 72, at the beginning of 73, you have the holy covenant. So verse 72, to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. The idea of covenant and oath, right there next to each other. So everything Zechariah is saying is pointing down to the idea of covenant, and everything Zechariah is saying is pointing away from the idea of oath to its ramifications. So what is at the center of the poem, what's at the center of his thought, what's the big deal in the poem, is that very center thing, and it's the oath, the covenant that he made with Abraham, the oath that he swore to our fathers. Let's put a pin in that. We're going to get back to it. But that's very significant for us in this room today. Very significant that that is the promise, that is the covenant that he's referring to. Okay, very significant. And so everything is building to that and away from that. But the idea here is Zechariah praising God, blessing God for the blessing of deliverance. And that's the idea of the, the message. That's the idea of the message is, uh, what do I call it? Uh, the blessing of a merciful God. That's what this, this message I called it. But the very first point as we get into our outline is this. Zechariah blesses God for providing the blessing of deliverance. He blesses God for providing the blessing of deliverance. Zechariah says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. You see, Israel had been waiting for deliverance. They, 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 had, they had a time in their history where they point back to deliverance. They point back to the deliverance as they, as they looked at e Israel being delivered from Egypt. They were delivered from Egypt by these, these powerful plagues, this powerful act of God, do, do, um, um, can't think of the word, it's, it's, and it's a silly, stupid word, I know this word, um, poured, out on, poured out on Egypt, poured out on Pharaoh. He had, he, had, he had done that and delivered them from that slavery in Egypt and delivered them into the promised land. But Israel had, had forfeited that deliverance because of their failure to keep the law, because of their failure to obey him, their failure to do the things that he asked them to do, which was promised in the Mosaic Covenant, would bless them. Because they failed to do it, he also made a promise in the Mosaic Covenant that he would curse them. And so he's cursed them and he removed them from the land. We know that he eventually brings them back, but never have they been, since they were delivered into captivity, they never again were outside of some kind of oppressor. 
They've been oppressed ever since. They were oppressed by Babylon. They were oppressed by Greece. They were Medo-Persia. They were oppressed by Greece. And right now, in this curtain context, they're being oppressed by Rome. They have not yet been delivered fully the way that they understood deliverance to be. They had not yet been delivered fully, and so they were waiting for this deliverance. They were waiting for this one who would come, who would deliver them from all these things. But what they really needed, most of anything, was deliverance from themselves. They needed deliverance from themselves. They needed deliverance from their sin. They needed to be raised up in salvation. But right now, they're they're looking at this deliverance that would come through this one so how does he promise? How does he, how does he deliver? Well, he lists for us five ways, five ways that this blessing deliverance that, that plays itself out. And the first is this. In verse 68, he, he blesses God for his deliverance and he has provided the blessing of redemption. Blessing of redemption. He says, blessed be the God, Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Redemption is a great concept. Redemption is an amazing concept. Redemption is the idea of buying something back or buying, really buying back a slave. That's what the idea of redemption is. You could, you could redeem things in Israel. In fact, they did it all the time according to the law. They would redeem their firstborn. See, every firstborn was God's. Every firstborn was God's, but what they could do, what they had to do was go redeem that firstborn. They would go buy that firstborn back from God. Um, in, in, in an act of redemption. They understood redemption, I think, more than we understand redemption. They understood redemption because that was something that they were required by the law as they were becoming really good law keepers as they get into the first century. They were required to do that. So they understood that, that they would, that there was this buying back. And so there was a promise of God that he would provide for them redemption, that he would provide for them this buying back, that he would take them back as his people. In the Old Testament, there was points when God said, you are no longer my people. That which was my people is not my people, but there's always a promise, always a promise. Every time God says, you are not my people, he ends with, but you are my people. You are my people, and he always buys them back. He always promises to deliver them. He always promises to bring them back to the place that he he intended for them in the first place. He always promises that. And as you get to Luke chapter one, that kind of deliverance has not happened yet. As we get to 20... 22, almost at the end, almost beginning 2023, that deliverance has not happened yet. He's not brought them to the place that he promised Abraham. He's not brought them back to that land yet. I believe he will. And so did Zechariah believe he will. So did Zechariah believe he would. So, so he's going to provide redemption. He's going to buy his people back. He's going to re- reestablish them as his people. That's a that's a blessing. But not only has he provided the blessing of redemption, he also provides the blessing of salvation. He says, and he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. This is significant because Zechariah understands immediately that this promised one who would deliver is not the son he just had. Not the son he just had. It's not John. Why would I say that? Well, because remember, Zechariah as a priest had to come from the tribe of Levi. He says here it's coming from the house of David. David is from the house of Judah. So he can't be talking about his son John. He's talking about somebody else who would come. Somebody else who would come. And so he says that God's going to raise up a horn of salvation from the house of his servant David. So he's saying John's not the guy. But he's going to talk about John a little bit. John's not the guy, but there is, there is that deliverer coming. And there is that one who would save that is coming. Uh, and so he's looking very forward to, is anticipating this horn of salvation that's going to be raised up for them. We know the idea uh, of, of the horn of salvation would be li- like the, the king of salvation, the king of peace, the one who would come to provide for them salvation. For the house of his, from the house of his servant David. So he's getting ready to raise up that guy. And so Zechariah, Zechariah, I think, is intensely thrilled that after 400 years of silence, now Zechariah is speaking to the people this promise of this coming salvation that they could anticipate. They could anticipate. 
But not only does he promise redemption and salvation, but he also provided the blessing of mercy, professing mercy. We talked about that, or Phil talked about that last week, that God is a merciful God. And mercy is something that they desperately needed. Mercy is something that we desperately need. Mercy is the idea of God not giving us what we deserve. If God were to give Israel at that point what we deserve, he would withhold. He'd actually withhold the Savior because they didn't deserve him. They didn't deserve him at all. They had, they had actually exalted the law above the place of God, and they had, they, had, they had begun to worship the law rather than the lawgiver. They were doing all of those kinds of things, and so they didn't deserve to be delivered, but God provides the blessing of mercy and does not give them what they deserve, but gives them something far better, far better. So he provides the blessing of redemption, the blessing of salvation, the blessing of mercy, the blessing of rescue. He promises that he will rescue them. Verses 73, is that where I am? Yeah. On the oath, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. So he provides the, the, the rescue, to deliver from the enemies. Yeah, now we could go make a long list of enemies, I'm not gonna do that, but there are all kinds of enemies that were in the face of Israel, and God has promised blessing Israel to deliver them from all those, all those enemies. So they could not uh, overtake them anymore. He would rescue them. Um, again, just, a, just an incredible promise of them. And then he provided the blessing of service. And this is one I want to spend a little bit of time on in Parkland. He provides the blessing of service. He says that we might serve him without fear. You see, it would be hard to serve God without fear, knowing our own sinfulness. If we, if we try to approach God in our own sinfulness, it'd really be hard to serve that God well, because we'd be scared to death of that God. But what he did was he made a way for us to serve him boldly and openly, he made a way for them to do that without fear because he provided for them what is, what is righteousness, holiness and righteousness. Where does holiness and righteousness come from for those who would follow God? We know it doesn't come from us. We know it doesn't come from us. We know holiness and righteousness comes from where? It comes from God himself. It comes from God himself. So in providing holiness and righteousness, he gave us the blessing of being able to serve. He gave them the blessing of being able to serve. And I believe that translates to us as well. Because God has given holiness, because God has granted righteousness, he's given us the ability to serve. Hebrews chapter four talks about going boldly to the throne of God. Um, it was impossible for the high priest to ever go boldly into the, high, the holy of holy place. He had to be just petrified uh, of that event. But we can boldly come before him. We have the blessing of service because we have been giving, given his holiness and we have been given his righteousness. Not something we can make up for ourselves, but it's a gift that he has given to us. He, he, he forgave us, and as he forgave us, then he gave us all this other stuff. It's, it's just amazing to recognize how we stand before God, declared righteous, and now are able to serve him, are able to serve him. So those are, th that's the blessing of, of deliverance that God has provided, but he didn't just provide the blessing of deliverance. He went beyond that, and in providing the blessing of deliverance, he also provides, Zechariah also blesses God for providing the herald of deliverance, the one who would herald that deliverer to come. And he recognizes that that is his son, because he changes gears in verse 76. In verse 76, he changes gears, and now he talks to the child. He's been talking to all of Israel. He's been giving the benediction to all of Israel, the benediction that, that should have been given nine months ago. He, now he comes out and gives that benediction. And now he's, he changes his focus away from, away from all of Israel and take, puts his focus right on his own son, right on his own son. And he says to the child, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. So he blesses God for the promise of the one who would be the herald of deliverance. That actually answers a prayer, answers part of the prophecy in Malachi when, God, when it said, and Elijah will come. And remember, the people of Israel were looking for Elijah. They were looking for Elijah, and, the, and, and John himself, when he gets old, says, no, I'm not Elijah. And Jesus says, yes, he is. Yes, he is. I tell you, I tell you, Jesus tells his disciples that this is Elijah. This is Elijah. 
And so the people were waiting for him, and, and, and even Zechariah says this of his child, you will be the prophet of the Most High. You'll be the herald. So what, what's he going to do? Well, first thing we know, he's going to be the prophet of God. He's going to be the prophet of God. And that's significant because there had been silence. 400 years, no prophet. 400 years, no one had spoken, and thus says the Lord to the people. For 400 years, no one had done anything like that. And now, 400 years have passed, and now John is getting ready to become the prophet of God. Someone who will speak the words of God, speak the words of God, and, and not care about what people think of him. You, you want to do an interesting study. Do a character sketch of the prophets of the Old Testament. Just do that sometime. Look at a character sketch of the prophets of the Old Testament. The real prophets of God never backed down when God told them to say something. They never said what the people wanted to hear. They always said what truth was. They always said what God had them say. That's the kind of man John was going to be. In fact, John was going to be so good at that that when Pharisees came out to get baptized, he said, who warned you to flee, you generation of vipers? He wasn't about making friends and influencing people. He was about influencing people with the truth. That's who he would become. He'd become that kind of a prophet. He would be that kind of a prophet of God, one who foretold what God had him to say, tell the truth. What was his main message? What was his main message? His main message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would call that. He would call that out. He would be the one who would make straight the way of the Lord. So he'd be the prophet of God. He would be the preparer of the way. He would be the preparer of the way. You will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord so to prepare his ways. He would be the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He would be the one who would, who would be the one saying, the king is coming. He would be the one who would say, um, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there he is. There he is. John actually said that once. There he is. That's him. He tells his disciples, a couple of us, don't follow me, go, go after him. He's the one. I can't even untie your shoelaces. That's who he is. That's not who I am. Zechariah knew that about John, and John knew that about John. He was the preparer of the way, the one who would cry in the wilderness and make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. And not only would be the prophet of God and the preparer of the way, but he will proclaim the knowledge of salvation. He would proclaim the knowledge of salvation. What was his message? What was his message? What was Zechariah saying his message would be? Well, look what he says. He says, he will, he will proclaim the way of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us. So what does he say? Well, he says, first of all, he will not proclaim the knowledge of salvation. And part of that, including forgiveness, the whole, the whole idea of salvation there with forgiveness of sin, but he's going to bless the people with mercy. Again, there's this, this, this idea of, of mercy that is all part of the, 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 the Christmas story, um, that mercy is coming. He says that he will, he will bless his people with light, the sunrise shall light upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. He would give light. He would bless his people with life. And he would bless his people with peace. Mercy, light, life, peace, if you want to fill in the blanks. That's the blessing. That's the blessing. But if you think we're done, you're wrong. Okay, you're totally wrong. Because we could look at that text, we could read that thing and have a nice Christmas service, and I could pray right now and go home, and we'd all say, what did that mean? What did that mean? What was the point? Well, let me tell you what I believe it means. Let me tell you what I believe the point to be. And I believe it goes back to what we talked about in the center point, the, the focal, focal point of the poem. And he says... He says in verse 72 and 73, he says to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us. This oath, this promise to Abraham is a very significant 
promise, and it's found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, or 12, 3, actually. And it says this, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did you hear that? I will bless those who bless you, and in whom and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see, this blessing, the, the Abrahamic blessing, the promise that was sworn to him, the covenant that was made with him, went far beyond, far beyond just a blessing to Israel. But the covenant goes far into everyone. Everyone who is on the face of the earth, because he says, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And what Zechariah is pointing to is he's pointing to that time when all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And that's really significant for you and me here. That's really significant for us. Because we need to recognize this blessing extends beyond the Jews because it's found in this Abrahamic covenant. And if it's, it is for you and it is for me, it is for everyone who believes. That blessing, what blessing? Well, what do we just say? The blessing of mercy, the blessing of salvation, the blessing of deliverance, the blessing of redemption. Sorry. The blessing of rescue. The blessing of light. The blessing of life. The blessing of peace. All those blessings, because this is rooted in the covenant made with Abraham, we are intended recipients of this blessing. We sit here in this room as believers, as blessed that way by God. And that makes Christmas worth, it, worth celebrating. If that doesn't make Christmas worth celebrating for you, then maybe you're, you need to rethink whether you're part of that blessing or not. But it's a great thing to recognize that this, because it's rooted in that, in that, in that focal point, the blessing given to Abraham, the oath that he swore to our fathers, that blessing ex extends and includes us here. And that's super important. Because if God, if Christ just came to save, save Israel, then we are, we are really hopeless. Because I don't believe there's many of us in here who could claim much Jewish heritage. So, so, we need to recognize and be excited about the blessing that we are included in. As you read this text, as you read these notes, as you read these things we're blessed with, every one of those things, every one of those words that we said, you are included in if you're a believer. You're included in that. Um, you really don't need anything else. But I believe there's another call here. There's another call here. I believe the second call here is that we believers need to take seriously our responsibility to, to, to need to take seriously our responsibility to be heralds of the good news. John was the one who would prepare the way. He was the one who had a special mission from God given to him to prepare the way. I would suggest that we as believers have been given that same, that same mission to be prepared, prepared of the way. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we as the church are commissioned to take the gospel. Mark 16, we're commissioned to take the gospel. John chapter 20, we are witnesses. And as he sent, as, as God sent him, so he sends us. Acts 1, 8, we are witnesses. Every gospel writer includes a, a, a command for us as believers to go and be heralds of the good news of God. We're, we're, we're commanded to do that. And you, you might say, well, um, let, let, let me ask, what keeps you back from doing that? So oftentimes it's fear. Here's great news. Here's great news. You don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be afraid anymore. I can give you a way to tell the gospel and never have to be afraid of it at all. Just tell the Christmas story. Just tell the Christmas story. If you tell the Christmas story, there's very few people, I mean, there are some, because we know people walk through that have never heard it before, but at least people understand Christmas, right? 
You just start with the Christmas story, but don't start in the manger. Don't start in the manger, start at creation. You know, get the notes, get the um, script, that's what it's called, get the script, and read through that script. If you were to read through the script of Journey to Judea and walk with somebody, walk them through that, you would present them the gospel, and it'd be very non-threatening because everybody likes babies in a manger. Everybody likes babies in a manger. But tell the Christmas story and don't start there. Don't start at the manger, start at the beginning. Start with the fact that God is the mighty creator God and that he is, he is the righteous ruler of all creation. Start with that. Talk about the failure of man. Man failed in their one responsibility to obey God. Man failed in that responsibility. And because of that, God had to judge them and promise death to them. Then, take them to Luke chapter 1. And look at all the blessings that are promised through this Redeemer who would come. Look at all those blessings. And it's only because of Jesus. It's only because of the story of redemption and salvation found in him. And then call. Call that one to repent. Call that one to repent. And the great news is you can let God use his word to accomplish his purpose. A lot of times we're afraid. We're afraid to tell the truth. We're, we're afraid to be those prophets. But we don't have to be. Well, Brian, you use a really bad example of prophets. Because what happened to John? Well, he got his head cut off. <laughs> but, you know, prophets were never treated nicely. Um, Isaiah was sawn in half. Jeremiah was thrown in prison. Ezekiel was one of the exiles. Amos was told, be quiet, go home. We don't want to hear you. Prophet after prophet after prophet was rejected. Jesus himself was crucified. (coughs) Prophets are rejected. What happens when we die as believers? We're in heaven. We're in heaven. Don't Don't let death make you afraid. You've been, you've been moved from death to life. Um, I, am, I have really, in the last three years, in the last week, I've become unafraid of death. Um, and and, and uh, it, it, it shouldn't scare us. That's, I think, the call for believers. What if you're not a believer here this morning? I want to be really serious with you. The the blessing doesn't extend to you. None of this. If you're here and you're not a believer today, this blessing does not extend to you. None of these blessings matter for you. Because you're not you're not one of those one of those who believe. Um, But here's the good news: it can. It can extend to you. It can extend to you right here and right now, right where you sit. As you recognize who God is, as you recognize, as you've heard the story of Christmas, you recognize that God is the almighty creator God, and he is the righteous ruler over all creation, that that none can stay his hand, that every purpose he purposes will be accomplished. That's the God of creation, and he created man, and he created us, he created Adam and Eve and put him in this perfect, beautiful environment and they sinned against him. They failed to obey. They saw him as stingy, as withholding blessing when all they ever want to do is bless completely. And because of their sin, God promised he would bring death and judgment into the world. And so now all of us, you and me, every person in this room, believer or unbeliever, we are all under the curse of sin and under the penalty of death. That includes you and there's nothing, there's nothing you can do about it. There's no thing you can do to clean yourself up. I love what Otto said, there's no no communion you can take, no act you can do, no words you can say, none of that will clean yourself up. Only the act of Christ. The work of Christ on the cross is the only thing that can clean you up. The work of Christ on the cross provides forgiveness of sin. The, 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 resurrection, the resurrection of Christ from the dead provides justification. It makes you stand before God, not in your righteousness, but in Christ's righteousness. That's the only thing. That's the only way to accomplish and be his
person. And I, I, I guess you need to understand that the call today is to repent. The call today is to respond. The call today is to reach out to him in faith, in, in belief, and become his child. And then all of these blessings, all of these blessings then get passed down to you. All these blessings become your blessings. All these blessings become true for you. Redemption, salvation, mercy, rescue, being able to serve, being able to be a prophet of God, being able to be prepared of the way, to have the blessing of mercy, the blessing of light, the blessing of life, the blessing of peace. All that happens as you respond to him in faith, as you respond to him in faith. Um, I guess the question I would ask is what's stopping you? What's stopping you? What's in the way? What's holding you back? If you really want to understand Christmas this morning, if you want to understand Christmas this year, if you understand blessing, the blessing of a merciful God, respond. Respond to him in truth. Um, my prayer is that all of us together, all of us in the overflow, all of those watching live stream, all of us will, will be able to enjoy Christmas the way God intended and be blessed, blessed by a merciful God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for giving us grace when we desperately need it. Thank you for the strength you gave me this morning to, to stumble through. Uh, I pray that you would uh, use my words uh, to be your words, and that you would work in hearts. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the great love that you've loved us with, the great blessing you've given to us. And we ask that you would work this morning in your name. Amen. All right, would you join me in standing?
you may be seated. I appreciate that. And um, excited this morning, uh, we have um, called upon you as a congregation to uh, vote on something. And so I'm going to ask all countryside members to stand if you're. A